Hi Ethics students, Dr. Bradley here with the Sunday message for week four. This is also a mini lecture about the week ahead, so do listen carefully and consider taking a few notes. Awesome class meeting last week. I know we had a couple of technical glitches, but I'm confident that we'll have them all sorted out before this upcoming week's uh, class meetings. We'll have class meetings this week at the same time, and as last week, you must attend one, either Thursday at noon Pacific Standard Time or Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Feel free to switch from one group to the other if that works for your schedule. I was super impressed with your understanding of the What is Morality chapter by James Rachels, but I have to say um, I was less confident about your understanding of the Moral Instinct article by Pinker. So because of this, I would like to recap his thesis to be sure that everybody understands, because you need to have these two thinkers clearly in mind as we move forward. What Pinker is arguing is that humans, all humans across cultures, have involved, evolved some common patterns of instinctive thinking on moral topics. There are certain areas that I outlined in the Prezi, uh, non-harming, fairness, loyalty to a group, deference to legitimate authorities, purity, and sanctity, where instinctive thinking often overrides rational thinking when humans are faced with ethical dilemmas that trigger these sensitive areas, these instinctive areas. The tro trolley problem version B, where you're asked if you would push a heavy person off a bridge to save five people, and the dilemma of siblings Julie and Mark wanting to be sexually intimate are particularly effective in evincing these powerful instinctive responses in us and illustrate the power of non-rational thinking in the face of rational evidence that certain actions are morally acceptable. However, this does not mean, and this is really important, that Pinker is an advocate of instinctive reactions as the right way to deal with ethical dilemmas. He's just acknowledging their power. At the end of the article, Pinker says quite clearly the opposite. He says, and I quote, our habit of moralizing problems, merging them with intuitions of purity and contamination, and resting content when we feel the right feelings can get in the way of doing the right thing. Far from debunking the whole enterprise of moral thinking as rational thinking, which was James, James Rachel's point, Pinker says that the science of moral instinct can actually advance the idea of a rational morality by allowing us to see through the illusions that evolution and culture have saddled us with. This is what I want you to remember. Also, last week, I never got around to the mini neuroscience lesson about competing parts of the brain. Pinker talks about this on page of the PDF that I made for you when he summarizes an experiment scientists conducted in which they sought to find signs of a conflict between brain areas associated with emotion, the ones that recoil from harming someone, and areas dedicated to rational analysis, the ones that calculate lives lost and saved. The scientist's experiment corroborated the theory that our non-utilitarian intuitions come from the victory of an emotional impulse over a cost-benefit analysis, and that this victory was literally the victory of one part of the brain over another. I thought I would show you some slides on this topic, which happens to be of particular interest to me. Here's a schematic of the human brain, which is an extremely complex organ, of course. What I want to point out to you are the parts of the brain relevant to this topic. Here is the dorsolateral frontal lobe. That means the upper and outer facing portions of the frontal lobe. Here is the medial or inward facing parts of the frontal lobe. And here is the medial frontal lobe. Uh, I'm sorry, the anterior cingulate cortex, uh, which is an evolutionary evolutionarily ancient strip lying at the base of the inner surface of each cerebral hemisphere. This part of the brain, the anterior cingulate, registers a conflict between an urge coming from one part of the rational part of the brain and the emotional part of the brain. If the part of the brain registering caring about other people is triggered, such as in the option of putting the fat, pushing the fat man off the bridge, then this part of the brain is activated and wins in the battle over signals from the dorsolateral part of the frontal lobe, lobe which is the calculating utilitarian part. No, this one. Um, here's another uh, evolutionarily ancient part of the brain uh, called the hippocampus that houses another caring part of this 
caring center of the brain right here called the amygdala. Similarly, when the amygdala is triggered, it often makes impulsive decisions about what the right thing to do is in, that is in conflict with the rational part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex up here. And unless the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex up here is trained to pause and evaluate, the amygdala often wins. So here we are at the beginning of week four. In addition to all this foundational understanding about reason, instinct, and moral thinking, I hope you all understand one key difference between an online class and a face-to-face -face class. But it takes time, effort, and a willingness to put yourself out there a bit to forge connections with your classmates and with me. These connections have the potential to make this class one that you will remember for a really long time. So reach out. Take the time to get to know one another when you hang out on Google Plus or Skype. Anywho, to the week ahead. This week we will focus on logic and language. We will just scratch the surface of a whole realm of philosophy that if this appeals to you, you can find an entire class about in college. Remember that logic is a field of philosophy as big as ethics itself. So we need to understand the basics so we can form a common language when we discuss the moral traditions and case studies coming up. So I'm about to try something new. This is what we're going to look at this week. So we are going to um, look at how ethics is argued, the premises, the conclusions, the concept of validity and soundness, and the formal analysis, uh, analytical tool that philosophers use called syllogisms. We're also going to look at types of statements when um, ethicists debate. And by the end of the week, you'll understand what formal empiric empirical and normative statements are. We'll also look at imperatives in ethics. An imperative, if you may know if you've studied Latin, is a command. X is the right thing to do, for example. And then, more importantly, or following from that, we'll be looking at competing imperatives. When you're faced with a situation in which there are two imperatives that contradict one another, you have a situation of competing imperatives. This forces you to make a judgment call about which is the stronger imperative and thus the one you should follow as the right thing to do. Difficult ethical dilemmas often put you in a situation of competing moral imperatives. Silly. For example, let's say you have a friend, we'll call the first friend Frankie at school, who's in a close re relationship with another friend of yours, we'll call this one Sammy. And Sammy trusts Frankly, com Frankie completely. However, Frankie tells tales behind Sammy's back, including ones that are lies. One time, Frankie said that Sammy was doing ecstasy at a school dance when this was not true, and word got out to the teachers, and Sammy got into trouble. What should you, as friend to both of these people, do? Here you are, stuck between competing imperatives. On the one hand, you should tell the truth. On the other hand, you should be loyal to your friend Frankie. On the third hand, you should be loyal to your friend Sammy. To resolve this dilemma, you have to choose between competing right things to do. Awkward. In the real world, ethical dilemmas are dilemmas because they're not easy to resolve. Either we are faced with competing imperatives, or people disagree about what the right answer is based on different, differing premises and arguments. However, we can learn to think our way clearly through these dilemmas when we learn to recognize faulty logic for what it is, sloppy thinking, emotions, and instinct overriding reason or, as we'll study in future weeks, different philosophies, not all of which are considered valid. So there you go, an introduction to the week. I'll have the full assignments posted as soon as I can. Monday morning, I hope. Except for Leo. I'm sorry, you're ready on to Monday. Take care. Bye.